Um, sorry I didn't send this out yesterday, but I recorded it and there was no audio, so I have to do it again. Um, chapter 3.2 is about uh, distribution graphs. Um, so we take the frequency charts that we made into 3.1 and now we're visually representing them. It's basically what this is about. Um, a distribution is just the spread of the data and the reason we use a graph is because it's very easy to see when you have um, a graph. It's kind of a little harder to, to look at when you're looking at the list of numbers because they you just see, you know, you can count down and look, you have to look down through and you see, okay, well that's the biggest group, but you don't get to really see what it looks like. Whereas on a graph, you see it more visually, you get to see it very easily because you, you can look at the high points and low points very quickly. Uh, and that's why we like to do graphs a lot. Um, so bar, pot, bar graphs are, um, they're just graphs with bars. Um, they can be vertical or horizontal. Um, when you were using Excel, bar charts go across and column charts go up and down, but they're just the same thing. It just it depends on you know which you like better. Um, we use them for qualitative data uh, because um, we can um, very easily put the, uh, t the titles at the bottom and we don't have to uh, worry about width or anything like that. So, you know, these are very common with qualitative data bar charts. Um, each bar represents the frequency of the category. Uh, and the higher the frequency, the longer the bar. You know, it makes sense. And this is what they look like. Notice we've taken um, the data over here in the frequency table and we've put it into the graph. It's much easier to see where the high points are and the low points are than having to count down and go, oh gee, I see C has 9 and F has 2. Whereas when we look at this we can easily see the high and low points. We may not know what the numbers are, but we can see them very quickly. Okay, Always, always, always make sure your bar starts at 0. Otherwise you're going to misrepresent the data and you know, we don't want that. So uh, we have to label our graphs. It's very important. Notice the graph at the top has SA grade uh, data. On the side it says frequency of grades and on the bottom it says the grade. We need to label all three pieces. Okay? Otherwise we don't know what we're looking at. We're just looking at a, a chart of graphs. So the top has a title. We want to be able to explain what we're showing in our title. Um, it should have as much information in there, as small number of words as possible. Uh, the vertical scale has a label because we want to know what those numbers represent. And we also need to know how many the tick, each tick mark represents. Notice in this case it's one, but we could have done two. We could have done two, four, six, eight all the way up. And so we want to make sure that we know what those tick marks represent as well as um, you know the numbers that they represent as well as the information. And Lastly, we need to do the horizontal scale because we need to know what each bar means. You know, otherwise, they're meaningless to us. So uh, we should always have those pieces of information out for us. And a legend: if we have more than, if we're charting more than one piece of data, we need to have a legend so we can tell each bar apart. And the the what will happen is each bar becomes a different color. You know, so we might have blue and. Uh, green and red representing the three different things that we're looking at. So we want to make sure that there's a, if we're doing more than one thing we have to have a legend otherwise we'll have no idea which value which bar represents which piece of data. So a dot plot is just a bar plot made with dots. Um, it was very popular in uh, early computing days because um, we couldn't make visual graphic things so we used to do X's or asterisks and to represent those values um, and it was just easier. We could do it on a typewriter, we could do it in Excel without having to worry about graphing, we could just put X's along and those, we could see them visually. So they've kind of fallen out of favor because we don't we can do laser printing, we don't have, you know, we have dot matrix printers anymore. So, but this is something that was used a long time ago. It's, they still want to mention it because every once in a while you'll come across it, but in most cases you're going to see a bar because it's just easier to, to create. So, but each dot represents the values. So we can count and go, oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Notice there's nine dots, and that must be nine high. But that's where they came from. 
A Pareto chart is a special uh, bar graph. And what it is, is that it goes from highest to lowest. Notice in the first one we have Chicago and Houston and Los Angeles and New York and Philadelphia. We can put those in any order. Okay, So a Pareto chart has to be only with qualitative data and it has to be with nominal qualitative data. Okay, Because we don't care what the order is. Whereas if we had first, second, third, fourth, fifth, if we switched those around it would you know, ruin the order. Whereas you know here we don't care if New York or Chicago goes first, so <coughs> sorry. So, but in a Pareto chart we go from highest to lowest, and it, it's nice because we can see them very easily and go, oh, okay, we have to, we can it's put us put them in order for us. Whereas you know here they're just they look like they may be in alphabetical order, which is perfectly fine as well. It doesn't matter you know to us in a nominal chart, but you know, visually the Pareto chart looks nicer. So that's why that comes along. So again a bar chart is a graph sorry, bar graph is a graph that has is represented by bars. A dot plot is a bar graph where we use dots. And a Pareto chart is a bar graph where we have nominal data only that is put in from highest to lowest. So those are your definitions of those graphs. A pie chart is a common thing you're going to see. It deals with um, relative frequency because we have percentages, all right? And we have a pie where it represents a 100%, and we chop it up into smaller pieces where each piece visually represents the percentage of uh, the the frequency. So this is 25% this is 25%, this is 50%. So each wedge has to be the right size of the relative frequency. Um, and then here's the definition of that again. So uh, it's a circle divided up into wedges. The wedges are proportional to the relative frequency. The whole thing has to equal 100. If it doesn't equal 100, you messed up. Um, now a graph where the numbers where we're graphing um, quantitative data, okay, a bar graph of that nature becomes a histogram. And one of the things that we do is we have to make sure that we fill in all the space between the horizontal axes because in a histogram, remember, we're having bins and the bin represents all the numbers between 200 and 300. So we have to make sure that all the values are represented. <coughs> we do that by filling in the area. And the same thing for 300 to 400 and 400 to 500 and so on. And notice we leave empty spaces where things do not, where, it, where bins are empty. So very important to, to have this information. And we're going to see this chart in a couple of different ways. This is um, energy consumption of states. So here they've done a histogram. Eventually we're going to do a CSM and plot of it. Uh, stem and leaf plot of it, which is gives you actually more information than this does. Um, but you know the the data will look the same, the graph will look the same. But very important in histogram to make sure that we include all the bin area. Here's the stem and leaf of that. Notice now what we're seeing is we're seeing all the states, and it's telling us where those states fell in each bin. Um, this isn't your normal stem and leaf. This is a specific one a specialized one. Uh, the next slide actually shows a better stem and leaf plot where what we do is we take the leading values and as the stem and only the last digit becomes the leaf. So um, it works well when you only have you know two digit numbers or three digit numbers. Um, if you have a long space it really becomes weird and, and not very useful so you round down to have two digits and then you do your stem and leaf. Um, whereas our stem here is represent this first one says that we have we had a value that was 0.3 and we had a value that was 0.7. And if we look on the graph we can see oh China was 0.7 and India was 0.3. And we didn't have anything that was one point anything, but we did have three that were in the two. And you put each value in there and you put them in, in ascending order. So it was two is the stem, you have six, six, and eight. So you have to show all the leaves. So again, here's definitions. A histogram is a bar graph for quantitative data um, at the interval or ratio level, doesn't matter. It has to be quantitative though. Um, 
<coughs> any quantitative data, and the bars have natural order, and the bar widths have meaning. The bar widths show the bins. A stem and leaf is kind of like a histogram, um, but except for bars, we see the listing of values. So that's kind of useful if we want to see where all the numbers are, because you know, the histogram, we don't see any of the numbers, we just see the bins, whereas a stem and leaf, we see all the values that look that go along with it. A line chart is, um, here they're telling you it's quantitative data, a bunch of dots connected with a line. Kind of makes sense. Um, when we're doing it with um, if over a histogram, notice, we put it in the middle of the bin. Okay, because as we're going to see later on, uh, when we kind of calculate means with frequency tables, we always take the middle value and use that as our um, <clears throat> basis because we don't know any of the other values. So we just assume, well, the middle value must represent most of it, and so we do that. Um, and they do the same thing here. So they they put the dot over the middle value of the bin, and then connect them. And a time series is a histogram or a line chart, no uh, where the horizontal axis is time. We don't care if it's minutes, hours, decades, centuries. It has to be time, though. And notice here they have all the years from 1960 up to 2005, and they're looking at homicide rates. And they have this time chart, and you can. It's nice because you can see over time what's happening. Notice we had an increase, and then we had the big drop off and started to come back up and now an even bigger drop off. So <coughs> it's this is what a time chart is. It's just so you can look at what's happening to something over time. 